Hey everybody, you're watching the Mike Nelson Show. We have over 400 subscribers. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure to subscribe. We got a lot of cool interviews, and today I got a really cool guest. I got Jeff Berlin, a legendary bassist. How you doing today, Jeff? I'm cool, Mike. How are you, buddy? I'm doing really good. Uh, right. You know, it's of course November 4th. How was your Halloween? Uh, well, I went out. I did. I decided to do a stretch on this, so I went out as a kind of a approaching seventy-year-old Jewish guy from Long Island. So that way, you know, I would appear as something completely different. <laughs> all right. So, when did your musical journey begin? Like listening to music. When did it all kick off for you? Let's see. Um, I came from a family that uh, was into music. My dad sang opera. My mother was uh, kind of a gifted musician she never really pursued it and I started on violin and I was uh, taught violin and played it at you know for at, at about uh, five years old and I was with it till about 15 or 16 and I was uh, well trained in it which sort of prepared me for my particular uh, educational uh, beliefs that I you know have been sort of sharing around these days and uh, it was the violin that really introduced me to the, let's say, the richness of, of music, you know, off an instrument as well as on it. So that's what I started with. Then the Beatles came along on Ed Sullivan. I actually recall seeing that show. I don't know why. There was a buzz, a group called the Beatles. I don't think I was aware of that type of music. And I saw them and thought, this is interesting. I, mean, I don't recall what I thought, but later, as everybody else, I was completely taken with, with the idea of plugging in an electrified instrument. And that's really what got me to the bass. So, you know, I play, I, I learned violin first as well. That was my first instrument. Do you think violin helped you play bass later? Well, certainly, because um, it's hard to ignore the, the training that we've had in something. It, you can't really put it aside so it sort of meshes I would say with other things so musically when I got to the bass it was the violin that led me to right away try to be technically at that time advanced you know for, for that era that I was an overplaying young man because I heard a million things I mean bass lines at that particular time weren't challenging in the sense that uh, someone and other guys that maybe are young musicians or, or guys that came along like I did, we musicians like me and like these people, we were all inquisitive about what we heard. So that's why I came at, I came at, uh, along in the 60s and that was a rock era. So I went straight into rock and in, in trying to be a Beatle and then later trying to be the bass player with Jimi Hendrix and then later the absolutely knowing I could have never been the bass player with Cream because I didn't have the harmonic sense that Jack had. So as a functional bass player, it was those groups. When I say functional, I mean doing their job. Noel Redding, to me, and this is just to me, I think he was a better bass player for Jimi Hendrix than Billy, what's his last name? I forgot his name. The guy that he, he was in Band of Gypsies along with Buddy Miles and the name he slipped up eluding me now. And uh, Billy, 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 he was a great bass player, but I always thought Noel was a better bass player than Billy, the guy with the uh, Band of Gypsies. Although I thought Band of Gypsies for me was a better band <laughs> than, than uh, the experience. It's a funny thing, but I, I hear music pretty deeply. It just comes from my background in music. So I notice things maybe that guys that sort of have my training or have my type of background, guys will notice interesting subtleties that might elude someone else that doesn't have that background. So I uh, I came along during the fertile 60s, man. Everybody wanted to play at that time. Now, at what age did you start playing the bass? How old were you? 14. Um, I was a newspaper boy and I saved money. And uh, uh, a guy uh, who later on went to be a very, his name is Seth Kimball, and he was lived in my town in Long Island in Great Neck. And uh, interestingly, uh, uh, Andy Kaufman lived in Great Neck. I never met him. He was a couple of years older than me. We, we attended the same high school and we had the same birthday. And we lived near each other. I just never met him. But anyway, Seth was in a band along with a phenomenal guitarist named Dean Balin. And this group 
were my first exposure to music outside of violin. And so I wanted to get a bass like Seth. So when I was 14, I had saved money from my paper route. And I went down to a Barrow's, no, it wasn't. It was uh, Barrow's Music, was it? I think it was. It was Barrow's Music in Great Neck. It's not there anymore. And I bought my first bass. And uh, I was 14. Now, you went to the Berkeley College of Music. You were, so you, were, you basically were classically trained uh, bass player, right? Well, I was a classically trained violinist. And then I would say in the sense of that, yes, I was a classically trained jazz student. Um, at, at When I attended Berkeley back in, I think it was 72, I started. I only attended two semesters. Um, but I was, I would call it a, a, a dedicated uh, like dedicated student. I just never stopped practicing, going to classes, playing with the best teachers or the best people I could find. So I was really hungry for it. Berkeley absolutely is responsible for the career I have. So yeah, I was classically trained in that. Uh, when I had lessons, they said, this is the exercise. This is how you do it. This is how you write it. And that background uh, formed me to be articulate in music and uh, by being self-taught, you know, by listening to records and the blues and the rock bands, I became, let's say, gritty in the attitude and styles of music. So I have both, but both came from violin and from Berkeley training and later from Charlie Benakis, who I had a lot of teachers over the years, but Charlie was the greatest, I would say, educator I ever knew. And a lot of people that studied with him will agree with me. And he was sort of in the, uh, uh, what, what was it? Dennis Sandoli level or, or, or Lenny Tristano. Guys may not know these names, but these were the names of the teachers that had the highest quality students. When I say quality, I mean the guys that were looking for quality instruction. You know, they offered the highest quality to the students who wanted to learn it. So uh, yeah, I'm classically trained in two things and let's say street trained in, an, in other approaches. Now you talk about street trained. Did you uh, kind of play in the New York jazz scene then in the early seventies, like the, the clubs and all that? How was the scene back then in New York, you know, for the jazz, jazz would you say jazz fusion, jazz, I know jazz fusion was going on in the seventies. So how was that? Well, it was fantastic. I, I'm lucky there was, there seems to have been two distinct communities that were happening in two parts of the United States at the same identical moment. One was the New York area, and the other one was the, the sort of South Florida area, the Fort Lauderdale's area. And that had guys like Gil Goldstein, Pat Metheny, Jaco Pastorius, Danny Gottlieb, uh, Bruce Hornsby, I'm trying to think of other names. There's a lot of Steve Morse. And then up in New York, at the same moment I was there, Will Lee was there, Anthony Jackson. Uh, 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 give me a second. There's, there's a million of them. Oh, my God. There's a million of them. The Brecker brothers. So, uh, and I was just thinking today, it's funny, that about this session I used to do at a club called Tuesdays, which was on the East east side of new york and we do the weekend and we play till six seven in the morning and i'm remembering this pro prolific time where everybody was oh liebman was there I, names are going to come to me joe lovano um so we were all playing and interacting i was an electric bass player i was also a guy that was uh let's say pre-therapy i went to therapy years later and uh, so I was sort of uh, not the same sort of easy guy to get along with. I feel that I am now. So that was happening, unfortunately. But they were very kind to me and, you know, saw me as a knucklehead guy trying to play everything I ever heard until I learned you have to edit and be more, you know, selective, selective about what you're playing. So, yeah, I was in the smack middle of the most prolific time, maybe in New York history, with the exception of the 52nd Street area era of Charlie Parker and, and Art Tatum and all those guys. Did you ever play a stand up bass in those times? Um, no, I dabbled, but I had so many years on an acoustic violin that I really didn't want to enter into a, an upright situation. I have to say, I kind of think that's where my calling was, you know, to go more electric. And it is even to this 
minute. I, I don't think I really feel that it's an instrument that I want to play, especially when you get guys like Dave Holland or John Patitucci and and like the monsters, masters of upright. I mean, just, uh, I, I don't think I would even be worthy of being hired or to pr provide something interesting when guys like these guys are around. You know what I mean? When did you finally get to play with Bill Bruford? How did you get connected with him? Well, when I first left Berkeley, I had a great summer. I was playing with, uh, I recorded my first record in Switzerland with Patrick Moraz. I was in a band with Carmine Apice, who had played with the Vanilla Fudge and with uh, Beck Boker and Apice, Cactus, which was a remarkable group. And I also toured with Pat Martino. So that was my wow. summer after leaving music <laughs> school. So, um, um, uh, uh, to repeat your question, because I went off on a little bit. You, when did you finally get to play with Bill Bruford? You know, you, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's you. fine. Yeah. Well, I uh, uh, in Carmine's band was a guitarist named Ray Gomez, who was friends with Patrick Moraz. And Patrick at that time was in Yes, who he had replaced uh, Rick Wakeman. I'm trying to get the the the, uh, the tree, the family tree, right. <laughs> and uh, Ray, uh, pa Patrick had heard from Bill Brook and said he wanted to put a band together. And Patrick said, "There's this wonderful guitarist in New York named Ray Gomez. He's actually from uh, it's like a French Spaniard type of area, you know, close to the French uh, Spanish border." And so Bill came to New York to play with Ray and Ray said, because we were in Carmine's band, would you play bass when I auditioned for Bill? I said, of course. So I went and played and Bill and I instantly hooked up while interestingly, Ray wasn't, you know, he's a phenomenal player because he went on to play with Stanley Clark and all those guys in the fusion era, but Bill wanted something else. So he later got Alan Holdsworth, but that's how I first hooked up with Bill and as drummer bassist and, he, he, we saw something in each other and I was honored because he was the guy from yes, you know, and uh, great drummer. I can, everyone can hear his original sounding drum sound. So when he came, I was really thrilled and he invited me to play with him. 1975 or 76 that happened. Now with the album feels good to me, you, of course you guys had a really awesome band, Alan Holdsworth, you, Bill Bruford. How was it like, you know, playing with these legends, you know, recording an album, you know, how was that? It was breathtaking because uh, I, they had uh, Annette Peacock, who was Gary Peacock's ex-wife. Uh, there was a flugelhorn player, uh, Kenny Wheeler. Uh, um, I suggested flugelhorn or trumpet, I think, to Bill. And Bill was very respectful of my thoughts. Sometimes he'll say, OK, that's where we'll go. Sometimes not, whatever. You know how we go. And playing and recording with those guys was an eye opener because I had never I was a kid in town you know, coming out of music school, who suddenly was in the middle of a very uh, rich uh, recording environment and, and top level musicians who took me in. So um, I was, my eyes were open. I was looking at these guys with, with awe and uh, tried my best, of, you know, to do something that might be interesting, but I really just overplayed on a lot of that stuff. Um, it, I confess, uh, I didn't know any other way to play. I just really, <laughs> you know, play I, I love that album though. It's really good though. I really think you did a good job on it. So thanks. It might be my second record or something, a third or something, but, uh, not bad for a, for a young guy who, you know, came along. I, I was again, bust, busting with ideas, but didn't know how to edit them. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> now, how was it like playing live with these guys? You guys, uh, do did you, did you tour? How was it, you know, with, with the Bruford solo act? How Did you guys do a lot of touring or how was it? We toured with uh, Alan, then Alan left. Alan was a, a kind of a bit of a uh, of a nomad. He always heard something else and saw something else and left a lot of bands because of that. Uh, I understand that. Then we had John Clark, who was a phenomenal, I still is, I, I hear, a phenomenal guitarist. Hi, John, if you hear of this. And Dave Stewart. And uh, Dave, by the way, is the unsung hero in the sense that I got more attention because I was doing something on bass that was sort of different. But there never would have been a successful Bruford band without Dave Stewart. That's just a flat fact. So when the four of us were playing, when we were on, it was wonderful. But also hyper over playing 
tons of rushing speakers distorting. I heard a couple of the live tracks back and I learned a lot afterwards that I would not play like that today. You know what I'm saying? But in the live thing, it was every night or whatever, five nights a week for, for several years, a couple of years. And we toured everywhere and it was, a you know, playing is obviously a place to hone that live playing uh, uh, reality in, in a person. So it was fabulous. I mean, people report to this day that heard us that they were very knocked out with the band. I mean, that's always an honor. That's always an honor. Now, with the gradually going tornado, you actually, uh, let's fast forward to the third album you made with, with Bill. Um, uh, you actually uh, started uh, singing, right? Uh-huh. And that, was that the first time you'd ever done that? Well, on a record, certainly. Well, yeah, I, I'm really no singer. If you listen to the vocals it's on that. It's not that much on there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a few, but it may be lucky for the listener there isn't. I'm not being falsely modest here, but I'm not really a qualified singer. I don't have a style. Um, although uh, I was imitated uh, by Peter Gabriel. He did imitate a thing I did, so I was kind of flattered by that. He did a, a, a version of a song. I don't even remember now. And he sang a lot sang it really long well i did that on on gradually going tornado and so gosh that's that was kind of cool um anyway uh yeah i sang but uh, i'm not a good vocalist i mean i sang on jack one song but i my father loved it because he's an ex-opera singer but uh, you know I, I just like singing melodies i'm a crooner without any tone and without any style but i can hit a pitch but I, that's all i have now let's fast forward to making the album, the Road Games album with Alan Holdsworth in 1983. How was that? Well, it was again, wonderful. Um, he gave me carte blanche, play what you wish. It was sort of a, an, a, 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 an event that happened by Eddie Van Halen. Eddie was a huge fan of the Bruford band and was absolutely, you know, head over heels in love with Alan. Adored Alan. I have some photos downstairs of Alan, Eddie and I. And uh, Eddie was and was very forthcoming with me. Lovely guy. I mean, maybe one of the kindest people I ever met in music. A truly, honestly decent, sweet guy. Aside the fact that he's a as as innovative as John Coltrane was, you know, in his genre. So he got uh, the the thing for for uh, for. Alan, Alan invited me and I had, I was permitted to, uh, to play and do what I wanted. And of course, you know, somebody was there editing, they would say, I don't recall the session too well, but I remember sitting a lot with Alan playing and we had fun because we were two young knuckleheads and that we had a good time. And uh, that's it. I mean, I had a chance to solo on one tune, which people seem quite fond of. I practiced that for weeks. I went over those changes for weeks and weeks because I know those things last forever. So, you know, recordings, you know what I mean? So I said, I have to learn what I'm doing. So I practiced hard. I'm, I'm, I'm still practicing. I practiced today before I called you. <laughs> I did. Now, let's fast forward to, you know, your latest release, Jack Songs, a tribute to the late, great Jack Bruce of Cream. You've oh, had, yeah. You had a lot of, you know, great musicians on this album. Alex Lifeson, Bumblefoot, Eric Johnson, even Sammy Hagar, Getty Lee. How, how did you put this whole project together and with all these legends? Well, one, these legends were kind. Two, they're fans of Jack. Three, they're friends of mine or might have known of my playing or admired my thing, trusted my musical decisions enough to say, I'll contribute, what do you need? You know what I mean? So I have a huge guest list because I had the idea that I'd like to make a record that isn't made today. And it's a record based entirely on the playing and I would say the arranging of music, but done in a rock sense, you know, done in, the, in a manner that it isn't fusion, although I guess I think some fusion elements may have come out. But uh, that's how I got these guys. I kind of wrote them some uh, guys that said, yeah, let's play. So this whole record is a record of assembly. It's an amazing result because the whole record came out organically perfectly. I, I mean it. Uh, the, the actual sequence, each song turned out to be an epic. Yeah, it's amazing, man. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And But it was really due to the producing skills of John McCracken because he had something like 130 you know, tracks and guys flying stuff in. 
And I'd be there with him. We work shoulder to shoulder, but he's the producer and he got this record to sound organically, forgive me, astonishing. <laughs> I just don't think there's a record quite like it now. No, there isn't. Not 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 in today's world, for sure. Not in today's world. <laughs> uh, now, and, go ahead. Yeah. And uh, so do you think, you know, Jack Bruce for you is your favorite, you know, rock bassist or what would you characterize Jack Bruce? What kind of bassist was he? What would you honor with? He's a man of all seasons, man for all seasons, kind of like Paul Schofield or something. He he was he was the actor who played a man for all seasons. And um, Jack was not his his musical life was not confined to cream. He had a lot before cream and he had even more after it. But Cream was the most astonishingly perfectly timed gathering of three great musicians who organically sounded astonishing together. In my opinion, there's never been a trio before or since in that genre, you know what I mean, the rock genre, that ever imit that ever could equal it. And no, yeah. I can I can discuss that another time, but that's <laughs> not you know worth doing now. But there's reasons for that. Anyways, Jack is he's not a rock bass player he's a jazz bass player he's an upright jazz musician incidentally so is james jamerson they both had a background on this thing and both were trained in music and became what they became through their own particular brilliance vision and the fact that they knew how to play and that they knew music so jack's thing was entirely based on his individual vision of bass you follow there really wasn't anything to, to precede him in this. He said he was influenced by Jamerson, but Jamerson was always an inside player. Always. He's, he was, if it's a G, he was in G. Remarkable bass lines, yet in G. What Jack did was be, he was the first guy to ever do something else other than the, the chord and then go out and then come back in. And it was so revolutionary that it literally had no precedence in the base world. I don't even think it had precedence on the upright. So that's the thing when I came up as a kid and I heard this, imagine this, I'm a kid, we don't were kids. We could not believe this band and we bass players especially could not believe that bass player. So Jack wasn't just a hero. Without him, I might not be the musician I am even to today. So. I owe him a debt and I owe him love and uh, I do miss him and we were friends. He's, you know, I, I, he knows that I always got nervous when he came around. So I would play sometimes if I was in Europe, something and he'd run in, go in the front row and then do this to me and I would mess up and, and he'd laugh at me. He just had the goods on me, but uh, yeah, Jack's my great hero. What was the best part about making uh, Jack songs? What was the, What was the best uh, like part? Best aspect you think of making this album? Well, there was quite a few. One, it is in a sense a musical one man project. I did the arranging. I played the bass. I played the keyboards. I asked people to play in certain ways, and then they, you know, you, you invite someone within a boundary. Um, I suggested edits. John did them all. Um, I wrote one and a half tunes. The other half was written by Pete Brown. So I have contributors, some of the biggest name musicians playing um, and would invite them to do things. I, I arranged like, you know, the bass relay with the eight bass players that has no precedent. So what's the best thing? I would say at the end of the day, I heard the playbacks. And I went, you know, you've heard that. Well, I better be careful. You can't polish a blah, blah. You know what I mean? <laughs> You can't polish a, 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 a part of something that leaves the body. You can't polish that. But for the time that we were listening back to the music, neither John nor I ever, ever felt that this was anything less than a masterpiece. And the, 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 the sensitive thing is, it does it sound like ego? I don't know. I just mean it that as a musical representation of that time in my life, I never could have done it better. And I'll tell you something else. I'll never do a record like it again. It wore me out. Wore us out. We're exhausted. But this was sort of a one-man musical operation. I did the horn arrangements. Uh, I, I did the vocal arrangements. I have several chorus kind of sounds. Uh, yeah, man, I'm beat. 
Now, but, that was going to be my next question. What was the most difficult aspect, you think, of making this album? Because it, it must be very difficult, you know, to cover, you know, the, these Cream songs are not easy to play. Some of them, they're not easy to arrange. What, what would you think would be the most difficult part? Well, I, I would say that it took years because, um, you know, we'd have to lay off and then come back because we couldn't find a record company in this era that was interested in this project, whereas now we're shopping it to, to other labels who might see the validity in it. But because of the fact that we did it all ourselves, it was exhausting, plum exhausting. I mean, uh, the effort was about as full bore as I've ever done as a musician. I composed whole new sections in it. I didn't take credit for it. I won't get paid for it. Because when you, I think if you arrange a tune, you're not getting uh, 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 compensated for that. But I would say that the exhausting part was that even when we were beat, we pressed on. We wanted to make a masterpiece that would last 20, 100 years. You know, Pat Metheny told an interesting story that when Bright Size Life came out with Jaco Pastorius and Bob Moses, that it didn't do well. But later it caught on and became a classic. My record's doing okay, but we're still in an era where people almost feel that they don't have to pay for music anymore. I pay for it. I buy it online sometimes if there's something. I don't like taking free music from people, but... It's sort of the thing that the times sort of reflect. And so we've done well. But in the old days, I'd have sold 200,000 if there wasn't an internet sort of thing or Spotify. But um, I guess what I'm saying is, is that uh, I think that this record might stay as a, and might be discovered as a classic record one day. I, I'm hoping. It's my fantasy. You know, who knows? Now, you mentioned streaming Spotify. Do you think Spotify and streaming is killing music? I do. I think it's a horrific uh, situation. Um, I had, we put it up on, I don't recall what it was. We put it up somewhere. It wasn't Spotify, it was on Spotify, but Spotify is, a, is I feel, forgive my bluntness, the enemy of, 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 of the music community. But we put it up somewhere and you could stream it, you know, to check it out. And we had, I can't recall if it was 6,000 streams and we got one sale. That's one. Crazy. Wow, that was it. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. Because, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm a lucky guy. And the lucky guy that I am is I accept life as it is. I, I don't really, if I, if I sell no records, eh, okay, I'm proud of the effort. If I sold a million, well, that's appreciated because it's something there for people I mean, I'm hearing from people all the time. You know who Mark Farner is? Yes, Mark Farner from Grand Funk Railroad. He wrote me the other day. And wow. just and just out of the blue because of the record. Wow. And and people are, you know, catching on. It's like in, in sort of the A-list and and fans and stuff. So I guess what I'm saying is after what, six thousand whatever's, you know what I mean? Um, no, nobody buys that stuff. I, I sell them through my website. And we sell downloads because people that do it are people that are into bass or into, into music and stuff. And uh, if I did this for money, it would have been a stupid uh, path that I you know, would have gone on. Because I know that music isn't a big seller today, but music entertainment is. And again, it's okay. I, I, I'll tell you an interesting story, if I may. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'd like, I wish we could see the record companies that uh, make a lot of money with rap and the popular genres of music to subsidize we players and we artists that are not currently in a popular uh, setting. Um, in the 70s, we were all were. If you could play, you were a star. Everybody was a star. I think you saw that in a Jocko uh, uh, biography. They that uh, Bootsy and Lenny White said this, you know, that if you could play, you were a star. In those yeah. days, you absolutely were. Um, today, uh, I, I'm pretty okay with the fact that whatever it is, it is, but wouldn't it be nice if record companies would recognize great artists, other than myself, just great artists, who nobody's ever going to hear of and who is never going to get their music out because the record companies have now become more of a business. Many of them are gone. Um, 
And it's sort of all on us, us consumers, all the people that don't buy music or don't support the arts, that the industry has changed as it does. I go to Europe to play because fortunately I'm very grateful and very popular there. America sort of isn't popular for, for jazz or this kind of thing, except if you're like an A-list or super, super, you know, high name. I'm just sort of a jazz yutz as it was, you know? So I kind of, I'd go to Europe and, and Asia and South America. And I'm kind of a, you know, as we say in Yiddish, I'm a big Gansemacher. In America, it's kind of, we're not a real music country anymore, in my opinion. We have some. I mean, there's great players here, no doubt about it. But uh, let me tell you a quick funny story. When Obama became president, I wrote him a letter and I said, dear Mr. President, I'm sure they opened a file on me somewhere because I did it. I didn't do anything bad. I said that when you do these, uh, you know, music at the White House shows, they used to do that where they had like the arts or something. You could turn once or twice during the, his every president's term, they had some evening with the arts. And when they did that, inevitably, it was always going to be one jazz guy who was always going to be Herbie Hancock, uh, one popular singer or R&B guy who was always going to be Stevie Wonder, uh, one more uh, gentle sort of songster, as it were, and that was almost always going to be uh, Paul Simon. In other words, this was the 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 musical community that was used in the regular of the highest level of presentation on American television. So I wrote to Obama and I said, sir, I said, do you realize that the only art that this country ever produced was singularly confined to music, where the only, uh, the only art that we produced was the blues, rock, or jazz? Only one. And it all came out of the African-American community, I might add. So I said, you know, we artists have to apply our trade outside of the United States. So if you do your next sort of, you know, the evening at the White House kind of shows, I mean, I'm not soliciting myself. And I told that in a letter. I said, oh, find people that represent the high level of jazz or, or rock that are not the names that are normally produced so that you as the president can stand up for the only art form that we ever invented in the United States. And well, I didn't hear back, and I guess he had other things to do other than deal with that. And I understand, but it's a I lot of letters, to... right? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> dear Mr. President, it's almost like uh, Bruce Almighty when he get a million prayers. He kept hearing them, uh, <laughs> so he must get a million letters. Nevertheless, I sent him that letter, and uh, you know, I stand for the arts, and also recognize the entertainment elements of music. So I'm for both. Well, I want to thank you, Jeff, for coming on the show. It was great talking to you. You were a great guest, man. Was it okay? Yeah, it was good. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Appreciate it. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Thanks for watching, everybody.